following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Students of religion <clears throat> or spirituality often have the question in their mind, what is the fastest way to enlightenment? And readers of spiritual books or followers of Buddhism or Hinduism often encounter this question being posed to a teacher. The nature of the question reveals many things about the person who asks it. But the most direct answer that can be given is that the fastest way to enlightenment is by the daily, hourly, moment-to-moment application of the fourth paramita, the fourth conscious attitude. That attitude is called heroic action. Sometimes it's translated as diligence or endeavor. But we've chosen to use the phrase heroic action because it most accurately brings into the mind of the listener the type of quality that we're describing. So if you hear the word diligence, it can be easy to confuse that with busyness. When we grow up, when we're being educated, we often hear that we need to be diligent students. So we develop this idea about diligence in our mind that it's something that we don't want to do. Because when we're students, we don't want to study. And oftentimes when we study religion or we study a spiritual path, we bring those same mental concepts with us that we had when we were younger. And we think diligence and we immediately feel, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want it to be easy. And this is often the tone that you hear behind that question. What is the fastest way to enlightenment? Often what you're hearing is, what is the easiest way? That's usually what the actual question is, even if they don't use those words. And if we have that question in our mind, what is the easiest way? We need to look closely at that. Conscious action or heroic action is the fourth conscious attitude of the paramitas. And when we look back on the perfections or the conscious attitudes we've already discussed, we see that the very first one, the intention, is usually called generosity. And in Gnosis we call this conscious love or cognizant love. Generosity sets up the, the aspiration, the intention to benefit others. 
And once that intention has arisen, the aspiration to develop bodhicitta, or the awakening mind, we then need to learn how to nullify the opposing factors which are within us. And that's why the second perfection is called self-discipline or ethics or morality. And these are the, the conscious attitudes whereby we control our own mind. We control ourselves. So that that inspiration, that aspiration to benefit others can actually manifest. And then the third force is the endurance to withstand the obstacles, the sufferings, the difficulties. Those three set in motion energy. When those three conscious attitudes are in balance with each other, they set in motion forces within us, within our consciousness. And those forces then need to be directed. And this is why with the fourth paramita is called heroic action. And this is why this is such an important paramita in the development of bodhicitta. The first three paramitas develop the aspiration and protect it. They develop the intention and then they shield it. So we have the generosity And then we have self-discipline and endurance, which protect that initial embryo. But as of yet, it has not been able to act. Because the first three conscious attitudes are just the armor. They're just the initial impulse, but shielded, given the opportunity to grow. But the growth of bodhicitta does not really begin until heroic action the fourth paramita begins to come into play. Therefore, it can be stated that all the previous paramitas are important but cannot lead to liberation on their own. The only one that can really bring the essence, the consciousness, into its full development is heroic action. Endurance, not endurance, endeavor, diligence, work. When you look at these perfections as they relate to the bhumis, or the levels of development of a bodhisattva, this fourth bhumi is called radiant. And it's called radiant because it's from heroic action that all the virtues of the soul emerge, like light, like rays of light from a sun. And there's no accident there in the use of the term radiant as a metaphor of the sun's light. This is a very um, cause-based, a causal term. It has causes, it has reasons behind it. In simplified terms, we could say that another way to define this paramita, diligence, endeavor, heroic action, is simply the joy to do good. It's having an enthusiasm to do good things, to do the right thing. And that root enthusiasm becomes full bodhisattva action when the soul is developed, when the bodhisattva is incarnated, when those virtues of the soul are actually manifesting themselves. And then the joy to do good becomes a way of life. To understand this a little deeper, we need to look at the tree of life, the Kabbalah. The top three spheres of the tree of life are called the supernal triangle or the solar logos. Logos means word. This, in its synthesis, is the cosmic Christ itself. These three express 
as that light of Christ. Just below that triangle is another triangle, which is a reflection of the one above it. If we say that this second triangle is our real being, our real inner nature, then we would say that the one above it is the being of our being, the root of our own being. So you see there are levels to the consciousness. Now the second triangle is composed of three spheres. And just like any trinity, in its complete development, these three are one. But this is not the state in us yet. The three in one, to actually bring those three together as one, signifies self-realization. To a certain level. Not complete, because there's work to do beyond that. But it does signify a major accomplishment in the path towards liberation. The three components of this triangle make up what we call our own being. The topmost, the uppermost, in Hebrew is called chesed. And in Sanskrit it's called atman. This is our own inner spirit. What in Christian terms is often called our own individual father. He is the root of our true self. He is not a self in the sense of an old man on a throne. He's well beyond that. He is a form of intelligence. But as spirit, as wind, as breath. He in himself, we can say, is our inner Elohim. In a synthetic way. To go deeper, he's really the child of our inner Elohim. But as a part of that, we can say he is that, Elohim. He has two souls, or two parts, through which he acts in the world. The one that's closest to him is the next sphere, called Geberah in Hebrew. This is the fifth sphere, counting downwards from the top. Gebra is also called the divine soul or the spiritual soul or the human or the consciousness, the divine consciousness. In mythology, Gebra is often symbolized as a beautiful woman, a virtuous woman, a woman of chastity. In Dante's Divine Comedy, she is Beatrice, Beatrice the woman of virtue who inspires Dante in all of his sufferings and endeavors. The one who gives him the strength of will to continue through his difficulties is her. She's also Helen of Troy. She's Guinevere. She is the beautiful woman of chastity who inspires her warrior knight. And the warrior knight is the following sphere, Tiferet. The warrior knight is the human soul or the human consciousness. That which we are is a, more or less a particle descended from this junction in the tree of life. What we have as free consciousness, what we know of as conscience, is really an embryo or a particle, a spark from the human soul, 
from Tiferet. But that spark is also very closely related with Geberah because that's also root of consciousness. These two spheres, Geberah and Tiferet, are sources of conscience, conscious knowledge, conscious understanding, which generally speaking we ignore in ourselves. And this is because our own mind, our ego, has become so loud, so powerful, that it drowns out the voice of our conscience. So these three spheres in Sanskrit are called, the first one is Atman, which is related to Chesed. The second one, Gebra, in Sanskrit is called Buddhi. The third, Tiferet, is called Manas. Buddhi in Sanskrit means intelligence or intellect. This is not intellect in the way we think of intellect. This is an abstract form of mind, something more intuitive. It's not a form of reasoning in the way we think of reasoning. Manas means mind. Tiferet is also related to mind, but also abstract, not concrete. It's a form of mind that is not stuck in materialistic processes. Geberah in the Tree of Life is called Geberah for a reason, the fifth sphere. This word means severity or justice. This sphere is closely related with karma, cause and effect. Justice or severity. Or you, can, you could even say ferocity. But how interesting is it that these qualities, justice and severity, are related with this beautiful maiden, the divine consciousness. Because in our mind, these two seem contradictory. But this is why we have these symbols, is to help us arrive at the actual meaning. When you consider the mythology of the knight, the warrior who goes into the battlefield to fight, and we remember the Western tradition of the troubadours, of chivalry, of knighthood, when the knight would go into battle, his inspiration would be his lady. He would do it for honor, for respect, in order to serve his lady, to protect her. His cause for fighting would be his virtuous woman who was waiting for him in his home or in his castle or in back where he comes from. This is all symbolic. Symbolic of the nature of our own consciousness, which has descended into the battlefield. We need to learn to fight on behalf of our lady who is inside. To have the diligence, the heroic action, in order to protect her. To fight for her, our own consciousness, our own divine soul. Interestingly, in the Kabbalah, of course, the tree of life that we look at here with its ten spheres is really a simplified tree. It condenses a much more elaborate structure. In truth, there are four worlds, not just this presentation here, but you could say there are four trees. And in the world of Atzilut, the world of emanations, which is a very elevated realm, this sphere of Gebra has the name of God, of Elohim Gibor. Remember, I mentioned that our own inner being is an Elohim. An Elohim is Hebrew and is a compound term. It's a term that refers firstly to gods and goddesses. El is Hebrew for God. Eloah means goddess. And Elohim is plural. So gods and goddesses is one meaning. But another meaning is Elohim, God and goddess. 
father, mother, male, female. Elohim Gibor. Gibor, of course, is another Hebrew word. Gibor means mighty warrior, hero. This word gibor also has some other very interesting meanings. It's also a rune from the Nordic language. The rune is the swastika, right? Called gibor. And this is the rune of action. The rune of strength. So Elohim gibor can be translated as the strength, the might of the gods and goddesses. Or the strength, the might of our own inner god, our own inner hero. <clears throat> when we remember the image of the divine consciousness, this Virtuous lady who waits in the castle. The castle symbolizes our own soul. The virtuous woman is this divine consciousness. The embodiment of all the virtues. And when all the ancient poets and troubadours composed their verses, singing of the beauties and virtues of their divine lady, they were singing of the divine soul. this aspect of our own consciousness, which has this purity and great virtue. Yet, let's be clear about something. It is not passive. When we have the image in our mind of the warrior who goes out to fight, we tend to put all the glory on him for his courage to go into battle. But he could not do it without his lady. He wouldn't have the courage, the strength, the reason to face the dangers of battle if he didn't have a lady to protect. Think about that. If you yourself have a true love and enemies are coming, you would do anything in your power to protect that love, to protect her, to protect him the one that you love, your spouse. In this analogy, of course, the enemies are our own egos. They are our pride, our anger, our lust. The warrior is our human soul, our essence, the Buddha nature who has to fight. The lady is our divine consciousness, the root of virtue. She inspires her knight through the power of her virtue, through the might of her virtuous strength. And this is not just an idea. It is not just a beautiful image. This is something that can be experienced. The power of conscious love is immeasurable. The power that resides within true conscious love. Another interesting and important correspondence here is the way the planetary influences affect these three spheres. Tiferet, the human soul, is influenced by Venus, which of course is the goddess of love, the planet of chastity. Tifereth is also influenced by the sun. And the sun is the force that regulates, that balances the other planets. Geberah is also influenced by the sun. They share this influence. And the sun, of course, is the source of light. Remember, the Bumi is called radiant. So Tifereth and Geberah not only have a close relationship in the tree of life, but they also have a close relationship astrologically. 
because of the influence of the sun and how it regulates forces, balances forces. Gebra, in addition to being influenced by the sun, is also influenced by Mars, as is Hesed, Atman. Both have Mars as an influence. Mars, of course, is the planet of war. Ares, the warrior, the fighter. But as its primary virtue, Mars delivers unto us the conscious value of love. The warrior, Mars, or Ares, the god of war, when that energy is polarized negatively, is hate or anger. And that force is what we generally think of when we think of war, hate or anger. But its true nature is love. It's only when it's polarized negatively that it becomes hate. But when it's pure, the force of Mars is a force of love. And that force of Mars is influencing Gebra and Chesed. These two spheres are the root of our own self really the root of love that we can find in us as soul and spirit. But this is conscious love. And this is the love of the warrior. That inspiration that the warrior has which drives him to battle. So in the heart of Tiferet, we have Gebra and Hesed, which is the love, the cognizant love which drives him. And this is the Paramita heroic action. These things are important to understand because in the work of the Bodhisattva, each of these spheres has to be worked with consciously, directly. There are great integrations that occur inside the psyche related to these spheres. The quality of heroic action, which is inspired by a natural cognizant value can be seen in anyone if they bring it, if they use it, or if the circumstances provoke it. As an example, we often hear stories of people performing heroic deeds in an impulse. For example, we hear about um, someone becomes trapped underneath a car and another person impulsively runs over and picks up the car. This has happened numerous times and is documented. On their own, in other circumstances, that person could never lift the car. But their concern for the suffering person is so strong that it empowers them with strength they didn't know they had, which they otherwise could not access. That strength is the strength of Geberah. The cognizant love, the force of the warrior, the force of Mars, which empowers the individual to perform heroic action. This is just a crude example, which can arise because of circumstantial impacts. But in the Bodhisattva, that force has to be made prominent, continuous, always active from moment to moment, guiding each action guiding each decision. We can see in examples like that how when there's a great tragedy or a great disaster, some people go mad. They start to act crazy. But some become inspired with a great heroic courage to help others. And what you're seeing in the difference between the two is will. Qualities of the soul modified by will. So Gebra is the might, the strength, which resides in the soul, which gives inspiration to the warrior. And this strength has to be brought out by the bodhisattva, utilized. And the only way to do that is to awaken consciousness. 
Of course, the process to awaken consciousness is a process of transmutation and a process of meditation. But in synthesis, this love that Geberai gives is the joy to do good things for the benefit of others, to help others. This is why Samael Anvior said in the Pisces Sophia Unveiled that the whole of this work is performed based on conscious efforts and voluntary suffering. And why we find in Shanti Deva's book, the Bodhicharya Vatara, for as long as space remains, and for as long as wandering beings remain, may I too remain for that long, dispelling the sufferings of suffering beings, wandering beings. This intention is a reflection of this kind of enthusiastic diligence for heroic action. Really what it demonstrates, what it embodies, is conscious responsibility. This word responsibility also sometimes brings up negative connotations in us because we think, oh, this is like taking out the trash or paying the bills, which are things we don't like to do. But when we talk about conscious responsibility, we need to break this term down. Response, naturally, is how we respond. Response, ability. Ability is, of course, the ability to do so. So Conscious responsibility is the ability to consciously respond, to respond with consciousness. This is our responsibility. We all have that. Unfortunately, we don't use it we tend to ignore our ability to respond. And this is because of suffering. It's because of the ego. But when we really look sincerely at ourselves, we'll see a little contradiction here. We tend to go through life looking for the easy answers, the easy ways to do things to look for pleasure or comfort or security. And we, we expend enormous amounts of energy and effort towards trying to acquire this idea of security or safety or comfort. And if you reflect in your own life how many hours you've worked, how many days you've worked, how much effort you've made to try to acquire something to satisfy your idea of comfort or security, you will see you've spent pretty much your whole life. Pretty much your entire existence thus far has been spent towards trying to acquire this so-called security or so-called comfort or happiness. But have you acquired it? Has all of that effort actually brought you true happiness? If you reflect in your lifetime in meditation and discover the moments when you were truly happy, you'll find very interesting qualities in those moments. Firstly, the lack of I. True happiness does not have a sense of I. Our moments of true happiness instead have a quality of love a quality of natural being. We can look to examples when we were children, moments that could otherwise seem perfectly ordinary in which we experienced great happiness, but not as a sense of I or a sense of getting something that we really wanted, but as a sense of being. Maybe a memory of just being in the, in the yard, being sitting on the grass or playing with a sibling or a friend just a sense of natural enjoyment. And what we find in those moments is that our relationship to time is different. 
Notice in your life, the moments when you've really been happy, you forget time. Time seems to go at a different speed. But in the moments when we're really suffering, time is unbearable. Time seems to drag. And this is because time is relative. This is something that Einstein taught. Time is relative to our state of consciousness. When we're really happy, time is not a factor. It seems to go faster. But in reality, if you look back at the moments of childhood, time actually seemed to go very slow. Do you remember that when you were a kid? How the days stretched and stretched. Summer seemed endless until it got to the end and you had to go back to school. But at least in the midst of it, that happiness, there's a quality of consciousness which was different. And now, when you get older, time is going faster and faster. And the older you become, the more concrete your mind becomes, the more entrenched your habits become, the more identified we become, the faster time goes. So there's a little bit of a contradictory element. Do you see what I'm describing? When we're going through life mechanically, time seems to be going very fast. And when we're really identified with a particular moment of suffering, it seems to be endless, like when we're in pain. If you get hurt, if you're injured, it seems to last for a long time. But then when you get out of that moment and you get back to your normal life, time speeds What we can draw from this is that our experience of time is relative to our state of consciousness. When we're really present, when we're really being, time stops. Time ceases to be an issue. This is important because when we consider this work we tend to think that it's too much. The path to awaken is too much. Especially when we study Kabbalah, it seems overwhelming. Too complicated, too difficult. But if we shift our attitude, our conscious attitude, it doesn't need to be experienced in that way. We can experience the work with enthusiasm. The quality, the ability to do that, of course, comes from Gebra. This inspiration of love. Our experiences of suffering, our experiences of dejection, of defeatism, arise because we become identified with an I, with an ego, with a desire. But if we instead take inspiration from our divine consciousness become inspired by love, our love for others, our love for our own Divine Mother, time is no longer an issue. We can be in the moment. Enduring any suffering and working in the right way. In this Divine Soul is where we find all the intelligence, the wisdom of our being. It's stated in certain Hindu scriptures that buddhi is like a vase within which a light burns. That light is Atman. Buddhi is the container, the soul that expresses it. So all of the intelligence, all of the wisdom of our own inner being is within Geberah. And that's within us. What more do we need? We've forgotten it. But through the application of this type of work, through meditation, through transmutation, we can restore our connection with that force, with that intelligence. But to do so, we have to deal with the obstacles.
the obstacle that stands in our way is ourselves. What keeps us from being diligent, from having enthusiasm to take action in a heroic way, is our own mind, our own ego. And the primary definition of this aspect of ourselves is laziness. We tend to say this word, laziness. But don't think that laziness is just lying on the couch. Laziness has many faces. If we read in Shantideva's Bodhicharya Vatara, he says, what is joyful perseverance, this paramita? It is zestful vigor for being constructive. Its opposing factors are explained as lethargy, clinging to what is negative or petty, and being discouraged or disparaging oneself. These are all forms of laziness. Conscious qualities, or what do we say? Actually, the laziness of the consciousness. Lazy consciousness. So the first one he says is lethargy. Obviously, we mean lethargy of the consciousness, not just the physical body. We could be very busy physically and be very lazy as a consciousness. And many of us, maybe most of us, are exactly that. Very busy physically, very active lives, running here and there all the time. But our consciousness is completely asleep. Yeah, many of us are just workaholics. We work and work and work. This is not diligence, this is obstinacy. Diligence as a conscious virtue is the diligence of the consciousness to be active, to be present, to be watchful, to be cognizant of every moment. This is real diligence. And that is a heroic action because our ego is huge and presents a lot of resistance. This lethargy of the consciousness manifests itself in the way we postpone our spiritual work. We postpone meditation. We postpone study of our spiritual pursuit. We postpone our efforts to do the practices. Well, I'm too busy this week, so next week I'll start meditating. Or I'm too busy right now, or I have too many things going on, or my mind is too active, I can't do it right now, maybe later. Maybe I'll work a few months, save some money, and then I'll go and meditate. This is all lethargy, laziness. As they say in some schools, this is the disease of tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow I will do it, definitely. This is a disease. We have many excuses, many justifications for our lethargy. We say, well, I need to make some money first. I need to have some savings before I can really be spiritual. I need to have some money in the bank. I need to have a house. Or I need to have a spouse. Can't really work till I have a spouse. These are excuses. Justifications for laziness. Some of us have the fear that if we become very serious about our spiritual work, we will become poor. We will not have money. Our job will fall apart. We'll be alone and without clothes and without food. We have this concept. And who brought that concept to us but the ego? 
you know well if you've studied Christianity that Jesus spoke about this very clearly numerous times. For example, do not put your treasures in the earth but in heaven is one example. Another one is the talk he gave about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. They don't have to worry for anything. God gives them everything. But how much more precious are we to God? So naturally, God will give us whatever we need. The basics of what we need, not want. This is a different thing. The vast majority of the things that we have in our mind as needs are just desires, just wants. Oh, I need that. I need new shoes. I need new clothes. I need a new couch. These are not needs. These are desires. What you need is a safe place to live, food to eat, a way to stay warm. What do you really need beyond that? Truly need. The master Padmasamava made a very direct statement about this. He said, It is impossible that you will suffer from want of food or clothing. The people who claim to lack food or clothes for Dharma practice, who have no time for spiritual practice, and say that they have no leisure for such things, are shamelessly fooling themselves. doesn't get more direct than that. And this is because he knows, as Jesus knows, that when you take the spiritual path seriously, your being, your God, will give you everything you need. Your being, your God, your divine mother, will never abandon you. Because they need you to work. They need the human soul, the warrior, to fight. No king would send his warrior into battle without the things that he needs to fight. The king needs the warrior to win. So the king will provide everything that fighter needs in order to win. We are the fighter. We are that warrior. And we should have faith in our king who is inside of us. So when our king gives us the weapons, the armaments, we shouldn't look at them and say, I really wanted a better one. Can I just get a better sword? Can I just get a better horse? Do I have to fight in this battlefield? Can I go fight in that one? It's much prettier over there. These Obstinate attitudes impede our progress. If you want to really know the fastest way to enlightenment, conquer yourself. Your wants, your so-called needs. We also have other excuses like this. A famous one is that our family won't understand. Our family will oppose us. Our family will reject us, will criticize us, will be hurt if we do what is right, if we take our spiritual path, if we perform a given action, conscious action. And because we have this excuse, this craving to be accepted by our family, these illusions about what our family wants or thinks, we persist in wrong actions. But it demonstrates the justifications that our mind will use to keep us from doing what's right. And there are many people who commit crimes and have these kinds of excuses to try to protect their family or to try to protect their wealth, to try to look good because they'll be embarrassed if they have to do a certain thing. So we have those same justifications unique to our own circumstances. But we have to be careful.
to clarify in our own mind when we're justifying ourselves, when we're just afraid to do what's right because of what people might think or because of our own fears about how we're perceived or how we will feel. The second aspect of laziness that Shantideva points out is distractions. He calls it clinging to what's negative or petty. Really, this is the craving we have to do things that have nothing to do with spirituality, nothing to do with the good of others. Distractions. Habitual tendencies. For example, this idea that we need to have a certain amount of money in the bank and then we'll be spiritual. Well, first I need to build up enough money for retirement. Then I can meditate and be, be serious. This is a harmful way of thinking because you don't know when your moment of death will arrive. And actually, Samuel M. Vior gave a very clear example of this, of a man he knew who was very interested in Gnosis but kept postponing his practice because he wanted to develop his property. He wanted to buy a certain amount of land before he died. Of course, he got sick and was dying, lost his opportunity for practice and told Samuel M. Vior that he regretted it very much to have been caught in that foolish idea of trying to accomplish something material first. This is why Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. We have many cravings, many desires, which push us to pursue futile habits, futile, futile, useless, things that are a waste of time. We have many excuses for these types of activities. A very good example for these days is all the distractions that we love to surround ourselves with. Many of us become very distracted by all our family activities. Oh, I need to go and support the family and be there for the family. We become very involved with a lot of futile, futile, useless activities. Going here, going there, doing this, doing that. For what? Or we become... We work so much that we get tired, and then when we come home, we want to watch TV, quote, to relax. We want to watch TV, quote, to just be. But be clear about something. When you're in front of the TV, you're not being. You are asleep. To be is a state of conscious activity. And when we watch television, we fall asleep as a consciousness. We become identified. This is not a spiritual practice. So we become identified with TV, with movies, with books, with movies, or with um, magazines. Some of us become addicted to travel, going and trying all kinds of restaurants, or going to clubs, or going to parties. All these distractions, which we justify as something that we need to help us relax, or to give us ordeals, but really, we're justifying our addiction to distractions. Some people are addicted to video games. Some people are addicted to shopping. Not because they need something, but because they're addicted to the sensations of shopping, the way it makes them feel. So instead of accumulating dharma, instead of accumulating good actions for ourselves and others, we're accumulating sensations. The sensations we get from TV, from movies, from parties. This is why in the traditional setting, practitioners were always required to abandon all of these worldly activities like parties, even music sometimes, even family. They were required to abandon those things because they are distractions from practice and they cause us to lose time, to waste time. Master Samael indicated many times that what we really need is to be simple. To have a simple life. 
We really don't need many things. We in this country, in the Western countries, have an overwhelming abundance of things. And yet we have the arrogance, the gluttony to want more. What we don't realize is in most countries of the world, families eat meat once a week. The rest of the week they eat a grain like rice and some vegetables, maybe some bread. Because they're impoverished. Because they can't afford it. And most of them sustain themselves that way very well. But we in the West want to have meat at every meal. We're very picky about what we eat. If a meal is not prepared in a certain way, or if it has onions in it, or if it has spinach on it, we won't touch it. This is gluttony, pride, arrogance, and it's an obstacle for us. It's really a form of laziness. It's a lack of endurance. It's a lack of acceptance. When we can't accept something, it's because of pride, because of arrogance. We're too proud to live simply. We want a bigger house. We want more things. We want to travel. We want to be a big shot. This is actually what the addiction of shopping is rooted in. Observe yourself when you go shopping and notice the feelings that you want to experience. You want to feel like people are jealous of you, envious of you. Oh, they've got a lot of money. Look at what they're buying. (gasps) Wow, I wish I could be like him. We want to feel that. We want to feel like we have the power to buy and, and acquire anything we want. So these are all distractions. The cause of this is that we haven't realized the futility of these types of behaviors. And we haven't realized the complications and problems they bring to us. If we were serious and started to really analyze our desires, to analyze why we keep buying things that we don't need, we buy stuff and we put it in the corner, and we buy something else and we put it in the corner, we buy something else and we put it in the corner, we haven't analyzed yet. and We need to analyze that. Why do we keep doing it? Why do we keep having the desire to watch these television shows or to watch these movies. What is the impulse that drives that desire? What will it bring? This is important for us to analyze, to think carefully, to meditate, and look at what will these activities bring? What will result? The third distraction or the third form of laziness is defeatism. This also has many faces. Defeatism basically is the, the idea or the feeling that we have of how could I do it? How could I become liberated? How can I become a Buddha? How can I even meditate? It's too hard. How can I learn Kabbalah? It's too complicated. And so we give up. Many students give up before they even start because the ego of defeatism is so strong. We want it to be easy. And this is especially prevalent in Western culture. If we can't get it today, then we don't even want it. Do you notice that? If we, it's a good way to see it is when we go to buy something, we go shopping. If we can't get it that day, we don't even want it. Forget it. We don't want to wait. And it's true of our spiritual practice. If we can't meditate today and have samadhi today, we're not even going to bother to try. This has to do with a certain type of mentality that's been cultivated in our advertising, in our media, which is a very goal-oriented or satisfaction-oriented attitude rather than a process-oriented attitude. We want to be masters today without having worked for it. Or we want to be a doctor today without having earned it, the degree. We have to shift our attention and realize success in meditation comes from effort. It comes from diligence. 
comes from endeavor, from action, from learning. Liberation comes from the process of learning about oneself. It isn't a pill. There is no magic pill for self-realization. Of course, all the Americans want one. And the Americans are willing to pay for it. Lots of money. This is evidenced by all the books that claim to have the latest great secret about liberation. Everybody's got the, the secret and they're revealing it for a price. Liberation cannot be bought or sold. It is impossible. It has to be earned. We have to earn it through our moment-to-moment effort to be cognizant and to transform our mind. One of the, there are three types of defeatism that the Master Samael pointed out. The first one is when we feel handicapped because we don't have an intellectual education. Some of us think, well, Gnosis is too complicated. There's too many words that I don't know. They use all these words from all these languages and it's too complicated. All this Kabbalah stuff, all of this Sanskrit and Hebrew, and I can't figure it out. This is a wrong attitude. What's important for us to remember in this context is exactly what Samael and Boyer points out. All of the great masters of the past, Homer, Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, Quetzalcoatl, none of them went to university. None of them had the kind of intellectual education that we imagine we should have. In fact, Samael and Vior pointed out quite specifically that of all the people he knew, there were only two who were really well prepared for Gnosis, and they were both illiterate. So the concept or the idea that we have to be intellectually educated first is false. What we need is a good heart. What we need is to awaken the consciousness, to be diligent, to work. All the education that we need resides within Gebra. The divine consciousness, that vase which within is the light of the being the intelligence of the being, our own inner master, who can teach us everything we need. The intellect is not the defining factor. An intellectual education is useful. The more we can understand in the intellect, the better. But if we do have limitations, don't just give up. Work. Make effort. We shouldn't confuse intellectual education with wisdom or with real knowledge. Real knowledge or gnosis has nothing to do with the intellect. It is a cognizant value which can be present in any person whether they're intellectual or not. The second defeatist attitude is to feel incapable of even beginning to enter into this work, even starting this work, because we feel overwhelmed, we feel uh, incapable. This arises in us because of two primary egos. The first is a defeatist ego that we have, that as soon as we want to begin something, the ego says, oh, I'm going to fail anyway, so I shouldn't even try. It's an ego that feels that we've always failed in everything. So why should we even try this? This is especially true of meditation. We may have tried a couple times to meditate, found that it was difficult, and then we give up. And then we have this ego that says, "Ah, it's too hard, I can't do it. I've tried and I can't do it. And then we give up. This is an ego. It's an ego 
that can totally block us from making real effort. The second one is simple laziness to even do the practices. The simple laziness to just remain mechanical and just remain self-defeated. The third form of defeatism is the way we tell ourselves that we don't have the opportunity to do this work, to reach self-realization. The opportunity is not there for us. And we have many excuses for this. Oh, I have kids. I have two jobs. I have to take care of my mother. I have no money. I have a limp. I'm sick. We have many excuses, but they're all excuses. Any living being, any living creature who has consciousness can work. You could be a paraplegic, blind, deaf, and mute in a hospital bed and still meditate because the consciousness is still there. Remember that. As difficult as your life becomes, as painful as circumstances become, you have consciousness. Therefore, you have the capacity to transform. But you have to will that. You have to want it. If you remain with the defeatist attitude, then things will only get worse for you. What makes the difference here is effort. Not theories. Not an easy life. This idea that well, if I can save up enough money and then life will become easier and then I can meditate. This is so delusional. Or the idea that to really be a spiritual person, we have to go and live in the woods. We have to go and live out in the peaceful countryside. This is also a delusion. The most opportune circumstances for self-realization are the most difficult circumstances of life. Period. An easy life will bring no change. An easy life will put you into a stupor. This is why we need to take advantage of our circumstances. This is why Samael and Vior said, the painful circumstances of life are the basic requirement for self-realization. Dalai Lama said the same thing. Padmasambhava said the same thing. Buddha said the same thing. So let's abandon the false idea that we need to find an easier, more comfortable, more secure lifestyle. That is a rhetoric of the ego that wants to put us into a psychological stupor to put us to sleep. When we hear about this path, we hear about how much work there is to do in the process of liberating ourselves from suffering. It's overwhelming. And the defeatist attitudes easily arise if we're not vigilant of our own mind. If we hear, for example, if someone tells us, with our science, you can reach Buddhahood in three years. Or with this teaching over here, you can develop your astral body in two weeks. And let me tell you, there are people saying these things. We love to hear that. We love to hear that there's an easier way, a faster way. Because our ego is the one whispering in the back of our minds, oh, it'll be easier. Let's go do that. Much better. You don't need to learn all that Kabbalah stuff. You don't need to do all that meditation. All you need to do is say this mantra or say this phrase or pay this guy some money and he'll give you a talisman or he'll give you a scripture to repeat over and over. <coughs> Just believe in this and then you'll be liberated in two weeks, in a month, two years. This is all delusion. The mind of a Buddha, the mind of an angel, does not arise by paying money to someone else.
It doesn't arise easily. It arises when it's been cleansed. When there are no more impurities in that mind, then the Buddha nature naturally shows itself. So when we hear that, we hear, oh, this could take my whole life. This could take more than this life. It could take several lives. We become defeated. Right there. But who is it that does that? It's the ego. So learn instead to turn this around. Learn to analyze this thought process. Think about it in this way. Meditate. Meditate on those feelings of defeatism. And I'm going to read you a little quote from Shantideva that will help you. He wrote this. The sage has chimed, a strong intention is the root of every constructive facet. And the root of that is constantly having meditated on the ripening results of karma. Pain, foul moods, and assorted forms of fear, and being parted from what I would like, come about from behaving with negative karma karmic force. But consider this. By enacting constructive deeds that my mind has intended, wherever I'm reborn, I'll be honored. Through their positive force with an oblation as the karmic result. But by enacting negative deeds, though I wish for happiness, wherever I'm reborn, I'll be assaulted through their negative karmic force by weapons of pain. In simple terms, every action we perform brings a consequence. Let us not be worried about whether it takes five years or 40 years or several lifetimes. Let us work in the moment now. Let us forget the concept of time. And instead, realize that our actions as a consciousness now will produce results. If we utilize our consciousness for the benefit of others, the results will be beneficial for everyone. That is how liberation arises. By the repeated and consistent inaction of heroic deeds. Heroic being in the consciousness doesn't mean you have to go and leap over a tall building. It means that you heroically control your mind and act from the intention of bodhicitta, which is to benefit others. You can have a very simple, humble life. It doesn't mean you have to teach gnosis and be in front of a huge crowd. It doesn't mean that you have to give millions of dollars to support the Dharma. If you are conscious as a person from moment to moment, you have an impact on everyone. If you are conscious in yourself, and controlling your ego, you irradiate something different. And that produces dharma. When you interact with other people and you are conscious of it, and you are centered in your consciousness and acting from that point of view of conscious, cognizant love, you impact them and you produce dharma. You produce good results. These are simple actions, but take great heroism The heroism is to fight against our own habitual tendencies of pride, of fear, of gluttony, etc. It seems very difficult, this work. And it is. But everything becomes easier the more we try. Not too long ago, you were struggling to learn the the letters of the alphabet. It was very difficult. Or you were struggling to learn how to walk, to ride a bicycle. But the more you try, gradually it becomes easier. And now, you don't even think about those things because you've mastered those skills. The same is true of Kabbalah, of meditation, of transmutation, of alchemy, of dream yoga. They're very difficult in the beginning. But by repeated effort, by trying, by trying, by trying, gradually we figure it out. And then it becomes natural. It becomes just a natural part of our life, just like taking a shower or brushing your teeth. Because the capacity to meditate 
is a capacity of the consciousness. The capacity to have astral experiences or dream yoga experiences is natural to the Buddha nature. It is natural to the mind. In fact, happiness is the natural state of the mind. Happiness, joy. This is why sometimes this paramita is translated as joyful perseverance. Joyful. You may observe some spiritual groups who do not have a joyful tone, who have a very sour tone. And there are actually Gnostic groups like this who have a very sour, bitter taste to how they practice the teaching. And this is unfortunate because the true nature of the Buddha nature, the true quality of our Buddha nature, our essence, is joy. If that Buddha nature is really being utilized in self-observation and self-remembering, if that Buddha nature is really being accessed through meditation, joyfulness is the natural result. Spontaneous. That's not something that we have to cultivate or fake. It's just there. When the ego is taken out of the way, that quality erupts. It emerges. Because that's its nature. So when you see a sour practitioner or a meditator who's got a very bitter flavor about their practice, they are not accessing samadhi. Simple. Someone who's really cultivating the, the science of developing samadhi is a joyful person, a very happy person, a peaceful person. Because those are the qualities of the mind, the, the real free consciousness. In that way, you can understand that the more you develop your connection with the consciousness through the repeated moment-to-moment effort to be aware of yourself, to be conscious, the more that natural joyfulness will arise. The more natural, spontaneous serenity becomes present for you. And in that context, the work to liberate yourself no longer is a matter of defeatism, It's no longer a matter of, oh, it's going to take forever. Or, oh, I'm not at my goal yet. I still don't have my astral body. Those attitudes fall away. It no longer is the point because the joyfulness of the Buddha nature has emerged. And in that context, the craving to have spiritual experiences also falls away. The craving for samadhi or the craving for experiences in the astral plane is different from the longing for it. The longing to know God, the longing to know the mysteries that lie beyond the physical senses is natural, is important. We need that. But that longing can be taken by the ego and turned into craving, to desire. And then we become obsessed The only result that will come from that is defeatism, disappointment. When we become obsessed with gnosis, obsessed with having experiences, we will defeat ourselves because God does not reward the ego. When we understand this nature of the consciousness to be happy, to be joyful, we see then that samsara and nirvana truly are states of mind. Samsara in Sanskrit is the world of suffering, of cyclical existence, where things repeat themselves because of karma. It's a state of suffering. Nirvana is seen as the cessation of suffering, as a state of happiness. But samsara and nirvana are two parts of one thing. They're two mental states. The bodhisattva seeks to transcend them both. This is something very subtle. The nirvana, or the the bodhisattva does not seek nirvana. Only the nirvani buddhas do. Only the shravakas do. The bodhisattva seeks to go beyond nirvana. This is a state of absolute equanimity. It's happiness. It is joy. 
but it's an inherent joy in the consciousness that's not relevant or not related to states of samsara or nirvana. These mental states dawn from within and they subside within the mind. The bodhisattva goes beyond these states and reaches a state of Tao, a state of balance that's no longer dependent on these changing states of mind due to circumstances. This is accomplished through all these paramitas working in union with each other. In order for us to have enthusiastic diligence, joyful perseverance, we have to discipline ourselves. We have to have patience. We have to have generosity. So when we encounter the lethargy of our consciousness, when we catch ourselves being identified, being distracted, persisting in a mechanical, habitual behavior which has no good result for anyone, let's react this way, the way Shantideva points it out. He says, therefore, just as I'd swiftly stand up at the slithering of a snake into my lap, likewise, at the slithering in of sleepiness or lethargy, I shall swiftly repulse it. Do not be complacent with laziness. Do not allow it within your mind. The importance of this is is, uh, strangely illustrated in a story that the Dalai Lama tells. He said that that the main thing that you need to acquire Buddhahood is courage and determination. And he gives an example. He said, Maitreya was a Buddha, but before he became a Buddha, he was a practitioner just like any one of us. And he had developed his bodhicitta, this quality, the aspiration to serve beings, very early. He developed it before the Buddha Shakyamuni did. So sometime later, the Buddha Shakyamuni developed his bodhicitta. So here we have these two practitioners. Yet, even though Shakyamuni developed his bodhicitta after, he reached full enlightenment before Maitreya did. Why? The path is the same. The requirements of the path are the same. The difference was that Shakyamuni had more diligence. More more joyful perseverance. He worked harder. He meditated more. They both had the bodhicitta. So if you really want to know the fastest way to enlightenment, cultivate more diligence. Eliminate the distractions in your life. Eliminate the useless activities and convert those into useful activities. Now, in order to do this, one of the things that we need also in order to overcome defeatism is confidence. Most of these forms of laziness or defeatism have a quality of of shame or a lack of confidence, which is an egotistical state. So it's very useful for us to reflect on this aspect. When we feel defeated, when we feel that we don't have the capacity to do the work, we are forgetting our being. We're forgetting our own God, our own inner Buddha. We're forgetting our Divine Mother. We need to remember our inner being. To remember our inner true self. Atman, Hesed, Gebra, the divine soul. We need to remember where we come from. Self-confidence, in this sense, has a few aspects as well. 
We need to have confidence in our ability to act. And this is quite simple. No matter what happens, in the next moment we will act. We will do something. Even if we just have a mental state, that mental state produces consequences. So whether we feel defeatist or not, we are producing results. So wouldn't it be better for us to have an attitude of hope rather than an attitude of despair? Wouldn't it make sense in the context of karma to be more hopeful than despairing? So abandon despair. It doesn't serve any purpose. And then with that comes the recognition that we can act. As limited as we might be, there are actions that we can perform. As limited as our capacity might be, there are things that we can do. And as I said, no matter what your station in life, no matter what kind of person you are or how burdened you are, you have a consciousness. And the basis of this work is to develop that, to be conscious. So there are things you can do. Even if you work 23 hours a day and you have no choice, even if you're in prison, even if you are a slave, you have consciousness. Become cognizant of each moment and you are working. Even if you are in bondage, you can develop your consciousness. So don't allow yourself to feel defeated or to give up. Be confident in your own ability to do this. The, the image that we need within us of self-confidence is not pride. Be clear about that. Pride has a big eye that wants to be seen and be distinct from others. The kind of self-confidence we're describing is the image that Shantideva uses, which is a lion. A lion surrounded by hyenas or jackals attacking it. The lion will fight and have great strength. And that lion is our own consciousness. The jackals are the egos. So do you see that throughout all of this, that when we talk about enemies, the enemies are always within not outside. The enemy is within. In this way, we can see that when we abandon defeatism, we abandon laziness, we are developing perseverance. Perseverance has to be carefully managed. We shouldn't take on too much. We should be prudent. When we take on something, we need to take it on with intelligence. Don't accept a duty or a responsibility that you cannot fulfill. If you decide in yourself to develop more diligence in your practice, it's good if you set a determination to practice, let's say, 10 minutes or 20 minutes to meditate. But when you make that decision, be sure that you can fulfill it. Don't overcommit. Because if you overcommit, you will fail and you will have more defeatism. And the same is true when you take a duty from another person, when someone asks you to do something. Part of being a successful person in life is taking on jobs that you can actually accomplish. This is part of what it is to be successful. Those people who have success in their various fields are the people who do the things that they know they can complete. And the ones that we call failures are often just people who did not properly manage or measure the job they were taking on. So they failed. Then they have this attitude or quality of defeatism. This is not necessary. When you take on something, measure the resistance. If someone asks you to perform a job, measure it and make sure you can actually do it before you say yes. And by doing that, taking that simple step, you assure yourself that you can do it. And then when you're done, you have built more confidence. This applies to everything in life. But in synthesis, we can say this. To really 
learn what heroic action is. Learn to apply it in conjunction with the three factors. Real heroic action arises spontaneously because the consciousness is within us. So our very first step has to be to remove the obstacles, which is the first factor of death. This should be really our priority. So when we're trying to cultivate our diligence or heroic action, our first priority is the death of the ego. To comprehend our own mind. This whole course is about bodhicitta, about conscious love. But we can't act heroically with bodhicitta if within us are the egos that will spoil it. So our first responsibility is to meditate on the ego constantly with great diligence, with great persistence, with great perseverance. Secondly is death, uh, is birth, sorry. Second one is birth. Birth naturally relates to transmutation, to alchemy, to the process of creating the soul, to creating virtues. Students who arrive to discovering Gnosis and studying the teaching many times become enamored of the factor of birth and put all of their intention and energy into doing a lot of transmutation practice, to doing a lot of um, effort to develop the soul or have experiences. And this is good, but they will quickly arrive to defeatism because they're looking for the results of birth but ignoring death. Again, this is why I'm emphasizing to you, begin with death. Look to have your results come from death. Look to measure your Gnostic practice in terms of the death of your eye. Don't measure your practice based on experiences, on samadhi, on having awakened experiences in other worlds. Measure it instead from the point of view of how much you change as a psychology, as a mind, how much you change your habits and behaviors. Exactly. We need to remove the I, not build a new I. The third factor is sacrifice. And again, here we see students who become enamored of this third factor and who want to be teachers, who want to be renowned instructors who want to be respected, who want to, even from their heart, give a lot. But without the factor of death, sacrifice becomes corrupted. Death needs to be the first factor. We need to first die as an I. And if, we are, if our efforts are first and foremost centered in the death of the I, the other factors unfold naturally. As the I is dying, the conscious values just emerge. This is a matter of course. Because each ego that's killed or destroyed, the conscious values that were trapped in it is freed. And those conscious values naturally perform sacrifice for others. Spontaneously. Without any artifice. Without any fakeness. So we need to know all three factors. But let's put more energy into the death of the ego. That means self-observe, self-remember, meditate. Those three encompass the way to develop heroic action. Let me state it once more so it's very clear. Heroic action means how we conquer ourselves. Later, once we've already conquered ourselves, then heroic action becomes action on behalf of others. Like the actions of Jesus or Buddha. Now naturally along the way to that state, 
we perform sacrifice. We may do heroic actions for others. But those actions will be corrupt so long as the ego is there. This is why I'm emphasizing developing a particular point of view when it comes to this particular paramita. Focus heroic action on oneself. And in that way, spontaneously and naturally, others will be benefited. And then little by little, we can shift focus until all of our attention becomes sacrifice for others. All of our heroic action becomes sacrifice. But we can't really help other people until we are free. Until we understand how to conquer the ego. We understand how to conquer ourselves. We understand how to meditate. Then you can really help someone else. But if you still don't know how to meditate, if you still don't know how to eliminate the ego, if you still don't know how to conquer your own mind, all you can do is confuse other people because you remain confused. Any questions? Mm-hmm. If you're in a mechanical state, right? you're doing things mechanically, and you commit a crime or you do something, but if you do that in a conscious state, is it more severe karma as a conscious individual or a mechanical? Okay, so the question really is, When you perform an action, is the karma greater if you do that action knowingly? Right. With all your being, instead of just doing it like as a sleepy individual, as just a motion. Right. The important thing to understand about karma is that it is a conscious law. It's not a mechanical law. By a mechanical law, we could say, um, and a good example would be gravity. Gravity is a mechanical law. If I pick up something and let go, it will fall. And there's really no way around that unless we apply other forces to it or something. Karma, on the other hand, is managed consciously by intelligences related to Geberah. And the first manager of that force is Geberah within us, our own divine consciousness. Our own being is the judge of the law in us. But beyond that, there's also actual judges of the law. When we perform an action, there are consequences for that action. What determines the consequences are the results of that action, not the intention. If we intend to cause harm, we will pay for that intention. Yes, if the result is harm. If we intend to cause harm and we do not, we don't pay so much. You see? You still pay. pay. If we do an action and harm, we pay. If we do an action and intend harm, we pay. So you see, the intention is sort of irrelevant. For example, when you park your car on the street out here and it's a street cleaning day, it doesn't matter if you intend to do it or not. You will get a ticket or you will get towed. And the law is like that, the karmic law. Is like that. But it's more conscious than that. Because the law also has mercy. But the law also has severity. Because see, these two aspects here, related to Mars, Gebra is justice, severity. Chesed is mercy. These are the two parts of the scale of the law. But these are within us. These are not outside. These are parts of our own being. That is to say, severity and mercy are the two aspects which balance the implications or the consequences of the action. Let me give you an example. If you perform an action not knowing that it's wrong, you acquire acquire karma for that. But if you know the law, you acquire more karma than you would have otherwise. 
But if you know and you teach the law, you require even more. If you teach the Dharma and you do something against the Dharma, you acquire way more karma than you would if you were someone who simply knew the Dharma or someone who didn't know it. You see the scale? This is why it's so important when we teach. The teaching is not just about giving lectures or talking to students. It's also about how you live your life. It's about knowing how to embody the law in your actions and how you deal with other people. Very big responsibility. And, you know, like we were talking about before, some people want to just be teachers because of pride. They want to be admired or different egotistical reasons. But it's very important to measure the true intentions that we have. Very important. Any other questions? Yes. Is being in a prosperous country surrounded by material comfort actually a form of karma or ordeal for spiritual efforts? Well, that's an interesting question. The question is, is being in a prosperous country or a comfortable place a, a kind of ordeal, right? Or a kind of karma? Everything is the result of previous causes. It's said that when we have material comfort, it's because we performed dharmic activities in the past. And this is because having a relative amount of comfort or security in life gives us the freedom to practice dharma more. Whereas if we're impoverished or sick or in a place where there's a war, it becomes very difficult to have a mind that's stable enough to meditate. If you're under threat of death, if at any moment your house could be blown up or a gunman could run in and kill everybody, it would be very hard for you to have the serenity necessary to really meditate. So you can say in that sense that living in a comfortable environment or a safe country is a form of dharma, is a benefit. Be my point of view. Right. So what happens then is that circumstances are also conscious. Our being gives us what we need. If our monad, our being, is really serious about pushing us into the path, our being can modify our karma in order to inspire us, to give us circumstances to push us to work. So we see, for example, certain masters or teachers in the past who may have had some dharma, but their being was pushing them so hard that they kept that bodhisattva in very difficult circumstances to push that bodhisattva to work. And that could be the case with any one of us. We may actually have dharma, but our being is holding it, keeping it, in order to push us to work. In certain cases, the being may say, well, let me give my human soul some comfort so they have a chance to develop a certain part of themselves or a certain aspect. So really it's individual. A, a being or a master or a bodhisattva who's working in the depths of the mind will actually seek out difficult circumstances because those circumstances are what they need in order to cultivate themselves further. Any other questions? Speaking about difficult mm -hmm. circumstances and, and working with that, right? Uh, yeah, uh, volunteer, voluntary suffering. Is that a... Can you expound on that? Yeah, voluntary suffering. Well, the basis of that is to, first of all, learn how to accept our suffering to accept it. This is a subtle thing. Because, of course, the point of doing this work is to overcome suffering, which means that we don't accept it. We want to change it. Right? We don't want to continue existing in a state of suffering. So when we say voluntary suffering, what does that mean? What that means 
is the willingness of a bodhisattva to take on adversity in order to transform that. The basis of the Shravakayana ideal, the foundational path, is to conquer suffering for one's own benefit, to come out of suffering. But the basis of Mahayana and Tantrayana is to transform suffering and in turn benefit other people. So this is what's meant by voluntary suffering. Our focus is no longer on simply escaping suffering. It is to transform it, to take advantage of circumstances. A good example of this would be uh, we may have a difficult situation in life. Let's say, for example, you have children. When you have kids, there are a lot of problems that come with that, a lot of difficulties. And if you as a parent take those difficulties with resentment, like, why do I have to deal with this? And why do I have to deal with this and that and put up with all these problems? That will create problems in the family. It will create problems for the children. It will create problems for you. But when you accept that, this is my reality. This is my situation. And you accept it consciously, willingly, then you can transform that suffering. It's no longer as painful. Then you can say, well, yeah, it's difficult, but it's worth it. It's worth it because I'm giving something to these kids. I'm providing for them. So that's a good example. But for a bodhisattva, it's another scale beyond that. Let me give you an example. One of the qualities of perseverance that uh, Shantideva points out is something called armor-like perseverance. This is a quality or a a value related to this paramita. And what armor-like means is it's to have this quality of heroic action developed to such a degree that nothing can penetrate it. Meaning that a bodhisattva can descend into the deepest hell and be there to help other beings but have absolutely no mental anguish. To have absolute perfect serenity in the mind. That is armor-like perseverance because that intention, the diligence is so strong that the sufferings of samsara cannot penetrate it. At the same time, the attractions of nirvana cannot penetrate it. This is armor-like. Now let's compare that with you and me. We're here in the city, and little tiny things can totally wipe out our perseverance and our diligence. We sit to meditate, and we get a little pain in our ankle, or there's somebody hammering next door, and we get all agitated, because of hammering or there's a car horn or somebody's yelling outside. Little things can disturb us, but what about being in the depths of hell where there's enormous pain and suffering? Can we be there and be serene? That capacity arises when we cultivate the quality of voluntary suffering, and this is the ability to accept things as they are and not be disturbed by them, but instead transform them. Acceptance in this way is the absence of pride. When we can't accept something that is a reality, it's because we have pride. It's our pride can't accept it. We're too good. We deserve better. Right? So this is a good opportunity to meditate on pride. Another question? Well, the question is, is having or not having material goods better or worse? Or getting rid of them a good thing, right? Is getting rid of them worse? Okay, I'm not getting the question right, I guess. No. Whether you have material things or not is really irrelevant. What's important is your relationship with them. When spiritual practitioners of the past were required to renounce their material goods, we have to understand that as a symbolic gesture. The real renunciation is in the mind. It's in the mind. It isn't a question of whether you have a lot of material things or not. You may renounce them physically. You may get rid of them all physically, but still have the attachment in your mind. Thus, you've accomplished nothing. But if you can renounce them in your mind 
to no longer have attachment in your psyche to any material things, then whether you have them or not, it doesn't matter. In fact, as a bodhisattva, it doesn't matter because you will take advantage of whatever the circumstances are. For example, a bodhisattva who's wealthy will be able to use that wealth solely for the benefit of others, not for themselves. But a bodhisattva who's impoverished will use that poverty to benefit others and not themselves. So whatever the circumstances, it's irrelevant. It's about attitude. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,